Okay, great. Uh, welcome, esteemed audience members and also esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for your time and uh, sharing your wisdom with us today on the panel about reimagining re philanthropy, uh, something from the elite few to the enabled many. I think that even before we get into this panel, we want to acknowledge um, and send our thoughts out to all the people caught in and affected by the Russia-Ukraine conflict um, at the moment but really to anybody um, living uh, through and in conflict areas around the world that doesn't currently get uh, the front page news. Mm. So we are here to talk about philanthropy. Uh, what shapes can philanthropy assume? Who can and needs to be a philanthropist? And more importantly, what is philanthropy's role in the 21st century and how can we all ensure that it does what it needs to do? Here to enlighten us about this really interesting topic of global solidarity are Krista Callan, MBE, dialing in from Kenya. Hi, Krista. Um, from the Tofauti Hi. Foundation and Third Wave Partner, we've got Stuart Hutton from the UK from Other Dots and Rufus Littman from his IC cabin in Sweden um, <laughs> from EdTech PT. Now, I could attempt to elevator pitch all of you with much fanfare and razzle dazzle, but instead, I'll just let you do it yourself. So, but, you know, we want to spice it up a little bit and not just have, uh, have you monologue about yourself. So, Krista, we're just going to get started with you. Um, introduce yourself and your organization. What are you all about? But more importantly, answer the following question. In your experience, what is one positive and one negative aspect of how philanthropy is practiced today? Krista. Thanks, Tom. And firstly, I'll, uh, I'll just point out if I am a bit delayed, apologies. I am dialing in from, from Kenya, but just brief a brief on the Tafauti Foundation. Um, I was lucky enough to be relatively successful at sport and so set up a, a foundation around uh, how I can make a difference. Tafauti means difference in Swahili, which is my uh, native tongue. I'm a third generation Kenyan. So, um, yeah, I've been lucky enough to sort of been brought up living on the continent. So I thought, why not leverage that and try and make a difference back here? So I hope to sort of give you some insights into into that. But more importantly, as you pointed out, Tom, the positives um, of philanthropy is that it's so topical now. I think now it's become this thing that we're all acutely aware of. And I think that's that's just so positive, just everyone trying to help, whether it's, you know, stuff close to home or, or further away. And I think that's that's super, super encouraging uh, to try and make a difference. And I guess the negative side of it is that sometimes we don't always appreciate the more holistic impacts um, that our philanthropic mm. giving does actually lead to. Um, we all have positive reasons for engaging in it, but it doesn't always work out absolutely to plan. Um, and I'm sure we'll get an opportunity to sort of delve into a little bit more detail of of possibly some of that so that's kind of the the brief elevator pitch from me we most assuredly will and i have a feeling that this might actually be a question for you later down the panel anybody out there listening if you would like to get in touch with krista the tafata foundation or third way partners um i'm going to drop her um her linkedin uh, uh, profile into the comment section now. And uh, moving on to Peter, uh, not to Peter, because Peter isn't here, but to Stuart. Um, Stuart, hey. similar question, really, <laughs> the same question that I asked um, Krista, in your experience, what is one positive and negative aspect of philanthropy and how it's practiced nowadays? Also, who are you and who is other <laughs> Okay, so well, I, I was going to kind of start with the, that kind of classic quote about how you know, charity starts at home but doesn't end there. And I think that's something we need to really think about when we talk about this as a topic. So who am I? Um, well, I'm, I'm not Peter Lazoo. I am Stuart Hutton, but I do work with Peter Lazoo. I'm one of the co-founders of Other Dots Foundation. And we are primarily a foundation looking at how uh, technology can be used to enhance uh, the broader perspective around education. So one of the factors we're looking at is that we see that there's a need, especially over the last couple of years, to use technology, using elements around like augmented reality to try and create an educational platform where individuals and groups of people can actually find a place to build an ability to actually produce educational um, material and ideas and thoughts mm -hmm. with a view that you can do something on that platform and not do it in the real world. You can actually understand what's happening and we can start to see how that impacts and affects. So we're primarily looking around areas like impact investing, environmental, but pretty much anything. In fact, uh, Krista, we must have a conversation at some point because I'm sure there's some good crossover on a number of different areas. Um, 
in terms of positive and negative, well, positive is obviously is that, you know, without philanthropy, a lot of things wouldn't happen. I think, you know, you, you've got to understand that, you know, philanthropy is something that um, makes people feel good and is good for people. And I think it's something that, um, you know, it's been missed on many occasions for a long time. But I think that is the kind of general understanding. I think the negative aspect is I think we spend too much time concentrating on the money, on the dollar. I think we need mm. to actually, I see Rufus is nodding already. I hope I haven't stolen your thunder, Rufus, but I know we have common views here. You know, we need to focus on humanitarianism, you know, what's happened to people, society. So I think we need a, there's a cultural shift going on anyway, and we need to change that and follow through with that. But let's, we can talk about that more, um, you know, later on the show, later the show, sorry. We can, shall, and uh, no, if you will, show. I'm dropping, uh, I'm dropping um, um, Stuart's link into the, uh, into the comment section as well, which brings us over to you, Rupus. Tell us about you, about your organization, and the one positive and one negative thing about, that you see in philanthropy practice now. <laughs> Let's talk uh, less about money and more about hu humanitarian. Uh, I love that. Uh, this will be a good dialogue. Uh, Rufus, um, um, I have a background as uh, from the beginning. I was a PhD studies and data science and, and uh, strategist for, for a lot of companies. Uh, but my true self is entrepreneur. So I've had like uh, six, seven uh, ventures and two, three, okay, exits. Uh, but this, what is relevant today is that uh, eight years ago, uh, I got uh, two twins uh, and uh, by becoming a parent, this was in the middle of the refugee crisis, the earlier refugee crisis in, in, in Europe. Uh, and I founded my first NGO uh, and I was totally amateur in, in doing that. I was rather commercial before that. Uh, but I had some, so I did some exits. So, so I invested some, some money in just, um, just taking care of doing what we could with, with a refugee crisis. So, and it went mm. rather good. We, we became, we did 17 interventions in, in all the Balkan route from, from, you know, German, Serbia, Croatia, uh, and with the boots on the ground with Syria and, and, and Iraq and, uh, uh helping 70,000 people and, and, uh, with, with li this little money, uh, and, mm. uh, and a lot of lot of being lot of being good in mobilizing um, engagement from a lot of we had hundreds of angels all over Europe helping us in, in doing that. So, so so that was rather amazing. And when when you started that, you cannot stop. So so after that, I've been mm. been converted from from entrepreneur to social entrepreneur and doing little little like like uh, you you were talking about uh, be, before. Uh, that uh, investing and and uh, working with with uh, with e e social impact things for everything that is good for people or the planet like clean tech or or, or ed tech uh, which is uh, yeah um, so that that's uh, that's more or less and and yes we, we should the, the good thing right now uh, is I think the the engagement is is fantastic uh, I think that this is what we've seen in the last five or ten years is that the governments and the states they're losing in in it, at least in the western world they're losing a lot of power uh, and the, the companies and the citizens are gaining power uh, mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a, some general level and but they're not mm -hmm. only gaining power they're gaining responsibility so so more more corporations is, is becoming ESG and not only greenwashing but actually taking a, a, a stand and a lot of citizens is actually going out on the streets and doing something so I think that's a really really positive thing and I think that's that's what we should embrace and and uh, help out with and enable uh, all this this positive movement uh, then the less positive thing is a little bit what, what we're talking about today. I love this subject because uh, what is that, that philanthropy, the, this old uh, definition of philanthropy being a lot about money and big, big lumps of money. Uh, while a philanthropy should, should everyone who's, who's, who's doing something that is good for the, for adding value to the, to the people of the planet is philanthropist for me. And it doesn't really matter if it's, mm -hmm. uh, if, if it's the, the small girl or boy sending their toys to, to refugees or if it's, uh, someone who, who's taking accountant uh, helping out in, in an NGO or if it's a, a taxi driver doing, doing some transportation or whatever. That's all phila philanthropy. And that's that's yeah. an un, unexploited, unrealized potential. There, there's more and more potential there if we can mobilize that in a good way. 
which is very much um, the theme. Thank you so much, Rufus. I've dropped Rufus's uh, LinkedIn uh, bio and connection into the chat box as well for anybody out there who would like to get in touch. And uh, what you mentioned, both all of you on the positive and negative points is what sort of shaped the idea behind this panel. How can we disband with conventional wisdom around philanthropy and make it much more accessible to all of us because we all have something to give. Uh, my name is Tom Zamzo. I'm the founder and owner of Zamzo Consulting. I focus on communications, on cross-sectoral partnerships and reputation management for individuals and organizations out there that want to broadcast and present their contribution to the global ESG uh, agenda. So let's hit this panel, everybody. And Stuart, we're actually going to start with you and do a deep dive into what philanthropy is all about. Because in your introductions, I asked about perception, but we haven't actually put on the table what we're talking about and what mm. philanthropy means by the textbook. So mm. um, what would your definition of philanthropy be, Stuart? And you get a second chance here. What would be the one thing that you would change about this definition? Yeah, it's a really good, really, really good question. Because I think you, you picked up something here that, you know, the, the text definition is kind of about, you know, the desire to promote the welfare of others, you know, by kind of generous donation of money to good causes. And this is the kind of textbook kind of focus on it. But actually, I mm. think we need to reverse that viewpoint. And what we need to do is look at philanthropy as something which actually is, you know, it's not a something about someone saying, I've got a lot of money and I want to give it away. But it's about saying from the other angle, saying those who are receiving that, what the benefit that gains from them, the impact that it's having. And I mean, I mean, Rufus, I mean, some fantastic phrases you use now around kind of added value and accessibility. And what we need to try and understand um, around philanthropy is how that can evolve into something which is more accessible. And that accessibility then does come back to the children giving their toys to refugees. Or, you know, I was involved earlier today with talking to somebody who runs a little kind of a coffee shop have a little old French fire engine and he's got a friend who's Ukrainian in the town I live in and he's got a collection point there so people can bring batteries and clothing so she can get that and then she's going to get it down to London they're going to get it shipped across to the mm. Polish border and the you know the turnaround is 48 hours now if that's not philanthropic what is you know I think there's a really kind of important focus on that I think the other aspect about it is that um what you talk about kind of what would I want to change I don't think I want to change anything because I think it's very personal. I think what you mustn't do is actually think that the philanthropy is something you have to fit into. I think you need to think about what it means to you and those you're having an impact mm. with. And I think philanthropy is patience. I think it needs something. It needs kind of somebody to be able to understand whatever you're trying to achieve doesn't just happen. You know, so this whole kind of phrase of, you know, teaching a man to fish as opposed to giving him fish kind of perspective has a really big application. So it's about being something that's patient and something that can work for long term. And, you know, I, I think probably both of my kind of fellow panelists have lots of examples to be able to offer how that kind of works. And the kind of people that we've been working with over the years, that's the one thing they've understood. You just don't get it on day one. But what you've got to understand is you've got to understand how you can measure that and work that forward. I think if I had to change one thing again, going back to and trying not to repeat too much is trying to get the focus away from the money. If we can have the focus away from the money, that's going to help us understand actually what philanthropy is truly about. And it's about mm. that kind of social aspect, you know, what we're trying to achieve in society, whether it be, and you know, again, you know, Christina, you know, in terms of your on the ground, you know, kind of, you know, in Kenya and in, in Africa, where this is a big part of, you know, um, what philanthropy is about. Philanthropy can be in your own town, you know, in a, a middle class town in England. It's, you know, we have people tonight in the cold at minor well, two or three degrees sleeping on the streets what can we do to help them you know i don't have to send money to kenya i can do it you know i can walk up my front door be there in 10 minutes in the car and help so what can you do and i think it's about caring i think that's the thing philanthropy needs to be about delivering something that's caring and if you can understand that perspective i think you can drill down and all this kind of um understanding what money can do for people but, you know, money isn't ultimately the answer of what they want. In fact, most people don't want money. They want training, education, support, help. They want other aspects. They want to make their lives better. So whether it is the eradication of a disease, that's still to make their lives better. I'm going to mm -hmm. pause there because there's one or two other things I'd like to pick up with. But I think we can do that kind of as the conversation flows. So thank you. Back, back to you, Tom. 
Um, I think you've mentioned a really piece here around this whole about the whole concept of philanthropy, and we're going to dissect it a little bit further as we move through uh, through this panel. But the notion of care as your fuel for it. It allows you to, if you want to run with the sentiment, if you have something, and we all have something that we care about, we all have a cause that we can get behind and rally behind and put our energy and our resources behind, that will allow you to break out of these conventions and norms that we're all being taught about what a certain thing is, and it makes it, you know, one of the something for us. Um, I will ask the same question in slightly different shapes, but I know that Rufus and Krista are also quite eager to get into the same uh, piece here, but Rufus, um, and we have been, we've touched on this before, but is philanthropy, does it only concern an exchange between the rich and the poor, or does it actually touch average Joe and Jane um, or anybody in between, um, like all of us here on the panel? And does it affect us much more than we might think? So not only the people where conventionally we, or the democracy, uh, uh, the the uh, geographies where we would be concerned with philanthropy, but does it have something to do with us? Actually, here in our warm, your cold shed, but theoretically warm home, <laughs> or is this really just between two demo uh, demographic um, segments? So do uh, should I feel the effects of philanthropy or the lack thereof? I think you're hit, hitting your uh, nail on the spike there. Uh, this is this is uh, exactly what what is all about, no? It, and uh, and I think uh, one of the the key key say one one of my favorite f phrases is uh, that nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something, no? And that's what we had in in. And that's not that's not what we're, we're, I've I've known a lot of Mother Teresa's uh, that, that put in hundred percent of the soul in the volunteering, and they they did that for one two three months or one year or two years, and then bam, they crashed. They they got depressed. They 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 got bankrupt or or, or whatever, no? Uh, so, so, and that's not, that's very good in the heart, no, but, but for, for being a prag more pragmatic <laughs> kind of a guy, being an entrepreneur, I see two things that are, are the most important things here to actually make things, things, uh, benefit, uh, for real. I call it ethical pragmatism. Uh, that's, that's one of the things is mobilizing a lot of people doing a little. Uh, doing their fair share. Everybody, everybody want, want, wants to be good. If they're not good, they want to be good. <laughs> and, and uh, they're just waiting for, for a possibility to do that. So that's what we should be able, we should be uh, building platforms that, 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 uh, that are made, be, so people are being able to do good. No. Uh, and that's what we did in here. Um, I have a background uh, being having some leading knowledge within digital marketing. So that's how we started. And we, we were rather good at mobilizing this when mm. even when I was some actual within this, this, this uh, part, you know. Uh, so I got a couple of thousand of people uh, donating, you know, and, and then at back then, uh, the re now we're doing much more professional than this refugee crisis. And this refugee crisis, now we're going to have four million people instead of one million people in Europe. So so it's it's even bigger. It even needs more mobilizing more troops now. But back then we 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 stored the stuff and I I used to I had two par apartments. So one of the apartments I stored suitcases up to the roof and and we we had people donating all night. And we got hundreds of people uh, putting things in different uh, cartoons, etc. So and, and they were angels. And and in the beginning we we did we did a lot of wrongs and and then fail fast with that. Being being an entrepreneur, you fail fast and then you find find the the good ways. No, so. So I mm. think I think that is one of the key things mobilizing for what did you call them Jane and Jim and Jane uh, Joe average Joe and Jane and average Joe and Jane. Jane mobilizing the hearts from 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 average Joe and, and Jane and the other mm. one is 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 not thinking the other key success factor uh, because we were uh, we we were and are uh, very successful. We have one percent administration cost instead of twenty, thirty, forty, like in the big NGOs. We have zero, uh, zero dollars for for salary, etc. Uh, and that the the second thing, the, the key success there is to thinking out of the box. No, if we're not in this institution and we're having the, mm. our rules and we've done this for all that, we didn't know the rules, so we broke them all. Uh, and we we thought we thought out of the box, and we we, we went down with with trucks and by the border, and we didn't get the truck in in Iraq. The in, the, the truck the trucks got stuck, and and so we went down partying at that nightclub and found a general Peshmerga soldier that was a cousin with with, mm. with, the, with the president, and he hey, called me tomorrow, and we fixed that, and the, he fixing in the trucks there, and we 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 found this. You were talking about this fish and giving fish or giving fish nets uh, b before Stuart, and so we we found this uh, Yazidi. Uh, 
women that was totally totally their men were killed and their 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 half of their sons uh, had been been killed and they had been in Mosul in ISIS and uh, they had nothing they they can do they had nothing nothing so uh, mm. we asked them can you do anything so yes we can sue but do you have sewing machines no they don't so i went up to sweden i, I said that on facebook i got 34 sewing machines within one week we shipped that down and now uh, we 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 have a small village there that are are sewing and making that as a living uh, and mm. and doing that for for not only their own clothes but selling the clothes etc so always thinking out of the box and we, we got another one in in Greece we got a, the, the the mayor the major mayor there and we we got the police station donated for 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 all of our stuff there uh, the, you know all of these things that that are not uh, not usual within the institutional stuff so it's i, I think this mm. is this is the the Jane and Joe, whatever you call them, uh, the, the, so the mobilize the engagement and the, but, but, you know making ten or twenty percent of your time and doing whatever you can. Everybody's good with something, you no? Know? And then thinking mm. out of the box, not following these rules uh, and, yeah. and being this. this I, I think there's an unrealized potential there out there that really is needed and it's actually possible. You know. I'm really enjoying this this story because it just means everybody has got so much more potential to do so much more yes. than they believe. It's not just you have a pair of pants that you can donate, but what if you actually talk to your neighbors and to your friends and then get things moving within the space that you can control? And you've also given answer to a really critical part of all of this. It sometimes appears to be quite remote of a thing, philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't, that's much, very much like climate, climate yes. um, uh, crisis. It doesn't affect us, you know, so maybe we care if we have time, but actually it does. Global climate affects us. Supply chain shortages affect us, uh, whether it is uh, mm -hmm. war refugees or climate refugees. The world is connected and we all move. And so it's time that we that we care and figure out how we can mobilize um, when we can and more importantly, also when we have to. But um, which brings me to Krista, which are, you have boots on the ground on a continent that is very classically and conventionally associated with philanthropy, especially uh, Western global North philanthropy. So, you know, me as, as a Northern European, bring me a bit closer as a, as a foreigner to the African continent. How does the practice of philanthropy touch um, your work and the people around you? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I, I, you know, I absolutely endorse both of the things the gentlemen have been saying on the panel here, where it's just sort of, you know, everybody can do something, but the reality is you can't change the world. And so I think we also have to bite off, you know, bits that we can genuinely impact on when, and that sort of thinking outside the box, be, not being afraid to be a bit different and go possibly against the grain uh, that notoriously has kind of been where I've kind of gone down the path less trodden a lot of the time. And mm -hmm. I go to really remote parts of Africa, right, where most people wouldn't even dream of going because it's it's slightly, you know, untouched. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, you know, Africa has got a handout mentality where, you know, the Western communities have supported Africa holistically for a very long time. And that's now created a reliance and not a resilience, uh, especially mm. within some of, some of some of the communities. And I think what we need to try and do where I find, you know, where we can genuinely make a difference is actually immersing into the fundamentals of the problem, right? You only know it when you live it. And I'm lucky enough to, to have visited numerous sort of, of these locations, sat underneath coconut trees with chiefs of villages and said, listen, in their native tongue, how do we uh, actually partner with you to solve solutions? And I'm effectively putting myself out of a job, or do it, albeit I do it pro bono, but it's like, how do I go on a journey with this community that can make them more resilient to be able to, you know, have this, this as a future. So to give you an example, I mean, we do something called the 10% fence plan. And the idea is to go into rural communities that neighbor national parks, right. Or, or conservation areas. And the idea here is to work with community members. So nominated community members to, put a fence solution, a solar solution, because they've historically had numerous issues with human wildlife conflict. You know, you can't tell elephants that they can't have the maze that's looking absolutely beautiful. You know, they just plow in there to grab it. Right. And then you get 
children get killed or, you know, retaliation, speared, whatever it may be. And, and there becomes a hatred for wildlife, right? So what we're trying to do is try and create this synergy between humans and wildlife and create a coexistence. So now they have to see that there's value to wildlife. So how we're trying to do it is very much saying the fence of your 10% of your land is because of the wildlife, right? The funding come because of the elephants. And now you have an area where you can have your homestead, have your have your livestock and your and your little shamba or whatever where you grow your crops, and we'd be able to protect it. And uh, by day or by night, the remaining ninety percent of your land is left to fallow because we've got a huge problem in Africa, which is a population boom. So you know, rural areas are starting, or, or wildlife corridors, should I say, are starting to get encroached hugely by uh, by people. So I think, yeah, I, I believe very much in you know the philanthropic side of experience something i'm not i i work in wildlife conservation absolutely so i'm going to endorse that but you know there's humanitarians there's all of this stuff just try some things and it can be an incredible like feeling of fulfillment which is exactly what i mm. think philanthropy gives you but have a little bit of now about you as to how you do it because it can it it, it it doesn't always go absolutely perfectly according to plan where i find that this really hits the mark is that one you, because you can always talk about local implementation, but I think the way in which you have illustrated this, it has to do with the language and not only verbal language, but it has to do with cultural language. How do different, and this applies to institutions, to sectors, to the NGO world versus corporate versus politics, how do all of these different cultures in a way ideate and get motivated and understand solutions and benefits in very different ways than we possibly would? Um, I think we have a pretty good scope of what philanthropy is, should be, couldn't be. Um, unless, Stuart, you've got something to add, because afterwards I want to get a bit practical. I, I just, I, I mean, I just think the, the, the perspective that Krista brought forward there around the immersiveness is a really, really valuable point. Because I think people nowadays so the accessibility of philanthropy needs to be expanded and understood better um mm. how that's delivered needs to be understood better as well and the immersive nature of being able to get people involved with it is a much better way than this isn't charitable donations philanthropy needs to be a far broader perspective and this term philanthropic investing has come to kind of front quite a bit recently and you know mm. people still are trying to get to understand what exactly that means and from my understanding, the idea behind philanthropic investing is you may give money, but the return on the investment is uh, uh, something deliverable. So I might give some money to a, a charity or a local authority or something in my town for recycling, and they buy recycling and, and waste bins, and therefore I have a tidier town, which means you know it's a nicer place to live. So there's lots of perspectives around this, but that's an you know it's back in that immersiveness because I think if we get the immersiveness. People are going to understand about what is needed. And I think that's a big factor. It's not just the dollar. It's not just about pouring money into this. And, and mm. I just, just one quick example of that is exactly what Rufus said. You know, going up to Sweden, getting a whole load of sewing machines and then shipping them down there. Brilliant. I did, you know, next time we do that, Rufus, let me know. I'll get a van. I'll come and bring them down with you. Because that, <laughs> that's what it's about. That, that, yeah, that, if I go and write a check, well, I don't write checks that. If I go to my on my line on my phone and I mm. send some money to a charity and then you know and I give to charities in Africa like Zane and Zimbabwe and places like that and, you know it's great and, I, and when I do it I get that very short term feeling like hopefully someone will benefit from that but it's lost there's no immersiveness it's just money mm. whereas if I spend a week driving from Sweden to Iraq with sewing machines I mean it's going to be tough I don't get me wrong <laughs> but the excitement that comes out and you know I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll bring sewing machines to Kenya I'll happily drive to Kenya as well you know although I think Sudan's not so successful these days but you know that's what it's about. It's being engaged and wanting to do something with it. You know, really important. Yeah. Back to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. The well, I find that we often the way there's just strong hurdle for people to get into doing anything. Really, is this this paralyzing sense of all of these problems are way too big. It's even uh, what does my the food that I eat on a daily basis have to do with anything with the, the climate crisis with refugee with refugee movement? It's too complex. The second that I start to look into it, I feel paralyzed. The sheer magnitude of the problem. 
which is in this next segment, I would really try for um, have us try to break this down a little bit and take this hurdle away, because I think we've established that everybody can get into the game. But the question is, how can you? So Rufus, imagine you're talking to somebody that has you know, perceived your story, followed you and is thinking, gosh, what this guy did, I can do by myself. What would you say to them? Where would they start to, how would you say, you don't have to do what I did, but you know, start to look around you and see what you can do. How would you guide them in just taking this first step? Because a, 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 an object in, in motion is easier to accelerate and move than one that is static. So how do you get people off the ground? Well, first, uh, that's an impossible question because uh, all all persons are, uh, all communication is contextual though. So different persons need uh, different yeah different kind of arguments but i would i would i would just uh, i want to propose that this is for ev this is about everything you can do like i think it was Stuart that you would say all value add uh, that you that you can do to to the people of the planet everything is is philanthropic and and that doesn't really matter if it if it if you can do stand, stand as a uh, doing packing everybody can do packing that, that, that doesn't have no you don't have to know knowledge knowledge at all no transportation if you, if you if you have a possibility if you're good at driving cars or if you are at the company helping doing good at communication making them ESG interested being an investor you can stop uh, investing only in, in commercial stuff but you can also have a social impact or you can be a, a young graduate you you choose to to work at a startup that that does some so, so social impact things instead of, of working for for a big bank that's also philanthropic, mm. no? Uh, or if, if you are, you are an influencer, inst instead of uh, instead of only communicating about, about the latest makeup, you're going to communicate about something, doing something good. That's had vast impact of, of mobilizing the, the the troops, no? Uh, and and uh, like, like so, so all of this. And living in a world when when, when we go uh, more and more from online from offline to online, digital warriors that programmers. Uh, you don't have to be Elon Musk and 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 uh, help out with satellite links to Ukraine or, or being a part of your uh, anonymous, if you heard about what, what they're doing to, to cyber war against uh, uh, Putin uh, right now, but, but being a digital warrior and, and, and helping out with programming for, for ed tech like, like Stuart was talking about and I also have been involved with or, or with, with clean tech or, or whatever. No, That's, You could always do something. Everybody's good with, with mm -hmm. something. So everything counts. That, that's the first thing. No? And then the second thing is that everyone counts. So this is this is everybody. What everyone who is good, <laughs> who wants to do, uh, be good, and most people want to be to be good, uh, the, the, at least some phase in their life when they understand that. Every nobody and nobody wants to die and die, and think that don't know if this world w w became a little bit better with them than without them. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants wants to do that. So everybody, and that's about meaning, no? And th there's nothing more meaningful mm -hmm. than philanthropic. Uh, so this is really about everyone, and it's about everything that can add value to, to the people and planet. And every, so I think that's the best pitch uh, for, for the, the most generic pitch. Uh, there are always contextual ones, but this is really, really for everything you can do, and it's about everyone that, that can uh, ship in something uh, th that will help uh, this to become a better world. Mm -hmm. I find this is a, this is a great concept because you don't it, it just take the magnitude out of it. It really is up to you to decide on what scale you can get engaged. Yes. But the second that you a ask yourself the question, what is it that I care about? And it can be anything because in any segment, in any topic, in any area, there will be somebody who can benefit from your expertise. You don't have to be an expert if you know a little bit more than somebody else. If you have a little bit more time. Go and give it and find your vehicle to do this and don't wait. I think this is a really um, interesting interesting point. Um, Krista, there's actually a comment from uh, Mark Stoneman, who is in the audience at the moment, who is giving you a big shout out to my fellow Kenyan. So we've got another Kenyan in the audience. <laughs> We're everywhere. Think... We're everywhere, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is perfect because this leads us into, into the next question that I actually had for you, which has to do with a bit of, uh, caution and a bit of words of advice. And you mentioned this earlier, but um, there's this notion out there that you know the predominantly Caucasian savior from the global north is meddling with affairs that they don't really understand, just to take the global north-south um, as an example. 
for anybody out there who is asking themselves these same questions, Mark is saying there's, you know, conventionally with fundraising, there's 15 to 20 percent admin charges to a lot of these um, NGOs that going to go to the final beneficiaries. How, what can people aid, elaborate a bit on the topic for us? Um, you know, do you have any words of advice or caution when people try to select whom they want to give to, what organization they want to do? How do you screen? How do you figure out if an organization is trustworthy and is legitimate? And what are some of the, some of the factors that you would ask people to look out for when they make their decisions? I think my first point, uh, Tom, would be don't knee jerk like straight into an organization. I'd say do your homework, you know, check people out, mm. make sure it aligns with your morals, your values, maybe the change you want to make in in the world. Um, you know, and, and some some organizations are very stringent on things that, that Mark rightfully points out. Right. The administrative costs of some of the, the larger projects sort of if you're talking mm. scale can get you know, fairly, fairly interesting and fairly sizable. So I would just make sure it aligns with exactly what you want. And I think the charitable sector or the philanthropic world has a responsibility to, uh, you know, Joe Bloggs, um, you know, when they want to give their money, it's like, right, this, we want to be transparent. We want to show you how everything works here. And I think we owe it to society nowadays to be able to provide exactly what it is that, uh, that the person who's donating requires and the feedback loop um you know it was mentioned earlier i think it was by stuart you know that that people want to feel connected they want to feel a part of having solved mm. or been been on a journey should i say for sake of a better way of putting it so that they that that sort of you're taking them with you and then that potentially leads to a longer term engagement right so how can we ensure that there's the connectivity in the cause that we're trying to lead somebody down and then of course the outcome but more specifically i'd say you know if we're talking about the historical elements of of what's happened in africa we've created something that i would call you know quick fix solutions or firework displays um which you know whilst i i don't i absolutely don't condemn the endeavor to try and do philanthropic giving what I do say is that I think sometimes we can we can just view a little bit more longer term. And I'd love to give you an example about what's happened or two different examples, one of which was on a conservancy that was set up in the Mara and everything, you know, a new area. Um, you know, all the leases taken out, all the Maasai who were, were in those areas were all then moved to outside of the conservancy area. It was absolutely dry as bone. There wasn't a blade of grass. And over, you know, five to six years or so, it all started to come back and the wildlife numbers are huge. The community, sorry, the, the tourism operators all lumped together and they all built a school. Right. And the idea was utilize your your um, your guests to all fundraise all give to obviously this beautiful wilderness area and then build a school. But they opted to build this school right on the conservancy border. And the, the longer term issues here, of course, is if these rural communities don't have access to things like education or health and sanitation or water provision, if you put in a provision and I'm not that is an absolutely lovely thing to be able to do. Unfortunately, a whole community moves there. Now you're bringing people to a wilderness area. And then, of course, there are knock on effects because we don't necessarily we're a bit blinkered in our solutions mm. sometimes. We think this is great and this is going to help us, but longer term, the impact that then happens. And also in the north of Kenya, you know, where big NGOs have put in, you know, tourism operations. And I've gone there two years later and microwaves and solar systems. And it's all in boxes because the local guys don't know how to run a tourism operation and they don't know how to work a microwave. If, so um, the irony of it all is you sort of walk into these places and you go, guys, what are you doing? And they're like, we're too scared to operate this thing because we don't know. And that's where we've been wrong. You know, we've assumed that they're, you know, they've had exposure to some of the things that we have a luxury of having exposure to. And going back to the original bit, which is the immersive bit, you know, we haven't taken the time. And if we don't take the time, then we can care as much as we want. But we're trying to make first world solutions for potentially mm. third world problems. And that doesn't always sink as well as we'd like it to. Um, but, yeah, those would just be sort of my views on some of the things I've, I've been lucky enough to 
I guess, see firsthand and be acutely aware of around some of the decision making mm. that you now have in this space to try and bring about the change we're all hoping to. Yeah. I'm seeing something very, very critical and it ties in with what we've been saying, what you've been saying throughout this entire panel. If you have, as a practical guideline, the opportunity to talk to somebody like Krista, who is within the charitable um, giving and implementation space, to ask these questions. What is actually happening on the ground? How critical are these organizations of their own? Do they have something of criticism to say or of caution like you just have? It means that there's this element of reflection that I think we have to all keep in mind, even with our best intentions, so that they don't go foul. Um, so. Stuart, this is obviously the most difficult of all questions towards the end of this panel. And I had threatened Peter with it originally, but as you are here now, you're on the spot. Who should be a philanthropist? And how could you or me or our esteemed audience out there go about doing our part in a world that is in dire need of solidarity? So unfortunately, I'm still waiting for Peter's answer to come through on WhatsApp, but uh, <laughs> so I'm going to I'm gonna have to make one up myself. Um, okay, okay. I, actually, it, you say it's a difficult question, but it shouldn't be, okay? We are in the 21st century. Um, you know, we, we see what's happening around us in terms of the climate emergency. We see what's happening around us in terms of the refugees. We see what's happening around humanitarian crises, whether it be the pandemic from COVID, whether it be the current crisis in Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, what's going on there. And we see this, this horror that's going on. So everybody has an opportunity. And I think there's a couple of things here. First, uh, going back to what Chris was saying, people need to listen. They need to, to listen and learn and understand. So as opposed to just going out there and being philanthropic, they need to listen. I think they also need a trigger. They need something, you know, that can make them really passionate about something. And, and I have a small example. Um, I'm helping uh, helping Kenyan, actually. Um, uh, a lady who's a nurse based here in Tanhe, family in Kisumu, um, wants to set up a small um, health centre there, primarily ultimately focusing on uh, uh, kidney dialysis. And I was ill in hospital for three days with COVID. I was on oxygen for three days, uh, very poorly for uh, several weeks. And she looked after me. And we became a very good contact. And she just talked to me about this, her passion. She didn't know, how, what can I do? How can I do it? I said, I'll help you. And she goes, great. And she says, I said, she says, you know, I don't know how much money I need. I said, well, I know another project similar that took place in um, in Uganda. I said, they needed about $15,000 to kind of build the building, get up and running. But they did it with the local tribe, the local authority, local people. And the, the, and they got and the elders and they got and they really understood it. And they controlled the project from the very beginning. You know, it wasn't the um, white man coming in and telling them what they should build and how many rooms. And it was the fun. And to a point, they even said, we're not going to fund it very. You're going to have to fund this. So this is something I can come back to. I said, but but the, the reason I want to get to is I think first your question is anybody can be and everybody should be. Let's start with that. OK, you know, there, there shouldn't be anybody. And in fact, it's quite often those who have least of all are more capable yes. and able to actually yes. do this kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You. I knew you'd like that one. Yes. But it, you yes. Know, yes. Yes. It's not, yes. Yes. It's not Bill Gates. It's not, it's not, they don't get, I don't take, want to take anything away from them, you know, but their focus and their press headlines are primarily because of the billions and billions of dollars pouring into it, of which 20% mm. is going into administration, as we understand, whatever it might be. It's sometimes the people with the least to offer that can actually come and do more. So I'm going to put something to this. Let's focus less on what we give in money. Let's focus what we can give in time. Time is one of the most precious commodities we have. When we finish this panel, I would have lost another 45 minutes of time. Yeah, you know, I, you know, it's another 45 minutes will pass. But this is 45 minutes of real value that hopefully I've added something, but I've learned as well. And anybody who listens to this in the next uh, week, month, or years. We'll learn something from and that 45, 45 minutes again. So time is so precious. Let's use that as a way of being able to deliver, deliver yes. philanthropy. And I just kind of a couple of things to pick up on that. I think, um, again, both my panelists have Dude, seen I think you may have about 25 seconds to do this. Okay, I've got 20 minutes. Okay. Automatically, is, so you better attack it, baby. Okay, mobilization, just do it. I was going to say, uh, creating resilience, I think is important. And I think transparency, just let's understand that. I'll pause. Mm. It carries on recording. If, if people have got things to add, you, you know, you don't have to stop right now. 
Oh, that's fantastic. I just received a message. Your original session has elapsed, but you can stay as long as you want. So, so we, finish your thought. So I got, we've got another 45 minutes, yeah? Go for ah. it. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a very hard commodity, this with time. Stuart. It is. But, yes. but Rufus, the, the, the harder the commodity is, the more value it has. Hmm. So, you know, if, if you know, to, to try and... Just to use your example of, I don't know how long it takes to drive Sweden to Iraq with sewing machines, but you know, to turn around and say to somebody, "Have you got the time to do that?" You know, you know, you yeah. can find the money is always there. You can yeah. always find the money. It comes from the most unusual places, but time it just is flowing through us all the time. It's just going. It, it falls through our fingers like water. It's not the same, mm. and therefore we've got to appreciate and respect it more. Let me fill in, fill, fill in some some numbers here, just just to mm. to validate what you're saying in 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 the text. But we we don't have like uh, we don't have one million to Mother Teresas out there. Uh, that that would be zero point zero one percent of the world. We have actually ten percent of of the world uh, who is volunteering, and mm. they're they're putting in thirteen percent of their time of their working hours. Uh, that is one hundred seven one hundred twenty five million full time employees a year. So that mm -hmm. is time, and that mm -hmm. is what 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 we. And what if we build build it? Uh, what in, in you you said it also? It's a it's an it's the twenty first century. It's mm -hmm. it's the time of the digital. It's an online era. What if we build this global uh, global platform that that can really do the matchmaking of all these efforts? That mm -hmm. so we, we so we know. I have this uh, little competence. Is anyone had any need of it? Yes, I do. Uh, 50 blocks away or I, I, I do 50, 50,000 miles away. Uh, so, so it's, it's, it, then we could double or triple that, that those 125 million, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, that we have. And that, that would mean in figures, that will mean $4 trillion. Mm -hmm. That's 10 times as much as, as is, is filled in, uh, that is donated every year in the old way, uh, with mm -hmm. the philanthropic, uh, when you're talking money, you know. So mm -hmm. I definitely think you're onto something here. It's, it's when you, when you talk about, about time, that mm -hmm. would really make a real footprint on what, what this, where this planet is going. And we haven't even mentioned blockchain and tokenization yet. There we go. <laughs> but, well, that's that's the next sentence. The next... <laughs> yeah. More stuff for the next for stuff for the next panel and for the next session. If there's anybody yeah. out there listening or seeing this that is working for Fiverr or Upwork, come and collaborate in the philanthropic <laughs> space because you've got the infrastructure <laughs> ready and we just need the connection. Krista, all the way from Kenya, closing remarks before we close the session. No, just that, um, you know, it's just super insightful to hear, to hear from others that are all sort of having the same battles just from different places, you know, and, and, and I just just echo really just just try something. It can be on your doorstep. It can be just being a better human by recycling more mm. just as the first step. Do you know what I mean? Just that's what we're all trying to do is 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 be the best version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And whatever it is that you're interested in, that you would really make you tick, would get you out of bed in the morning, you know, to get you away from the odd Zoom call here, here every other every other minute that we seem to attach ourselves to, you know, to, to feel like you're giving back. I mean, yeah. there's nothing more fulfilling than actually going back and seeing somebody that you have genuinely hand on heart supported yes. or helped yes. or nurtured yes. in order yes. for them to prosper and i think that is that that makes me proud when i'm mm -hmm. lucky enough to experience that and then it makes me want more and yes. so you know if somebody out there you can just help you know that that is it's super fulfilling and i just encourage you to do it because philanthropy starts at home and then from there you broaden your horizons so 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 give it a go I love you, Krista. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> yes. I think it's a state of mind, Krista. This is the thing. Philanthropy mm. is a state of mind. It's not just a giving. It's a, it's a something that people, you need to embed yourself in. You immerse. You need to, absolutely. Mm. This is perfect. Philanthropy is about caring. It's about getting started. And it's a state of mind. And on that note, Anybody out there, get in touch with these three fabulous, fabulous people. Check out the organizations and see what you can do to get engaged. This was our panel on reimagining philanthropy from the elite few to the enabled many. It's been such a pleasure to have all of you, to meet Brilliant. all of you, and I hope we'll meet soon in the cloud or in person if you're around Switzerland. Come give me a tinkle. Definitely. Bye, everybody. Have a Look good day. Thank you. Respect. Respect.
Love you. Love you guys. Take bye. care. Bye-bye. Cheers.